and progress can be slow, but I do think that if we can work with community members to really educate and figure out ways that community members can take action on their own, then like Laura was saying, you you can have so much impact, right? I think it's it shouldn't just be up to government to make that happen because whatever we can do as a community and me as a fellow community member and resident, I think that we can do a lot more than just what a government could do or just what one individual could do. Yeah, and I really want to add to that as well, like, because I, I, I actually really love the point that you're coming from, because I think local government and local council and, and state government as well are some of the best places that we can influence and make change. So like often when I'm referring to government, I do mean this kind of wider nationwide federal approach that we're looking at, which can be very difficult to move. But each of us does have influence within our local government, within our local area. And so having this kind of a, a ability to to create or to communicate what it is that we want for it for us together is a really powerful thing and i really appreciate what you're doing there namaste beautiful souls i'm shilpa and you're tuned into the omni mindfulness podcast a sanctuary for spiritual entrepreneurs as a holistic mindfulness coach and social marketing strategist i'm here to guide you on a transformative journey on this show we explore captivating stories and provide practical tools that deepen your connection with your authentic self through the personal and professional narratives of remarkable individuals we expand our consciousness and ignite the spark of possibility. Each season, I curate content that empowers you to create a holistic lifestyle encompassing spirituality, mindfulness, energy awareness, and mindset. Join me as we engage in conversations with experts in their respective fields and share solo casts from yours truly, all aimed at supporting you and relaxing, revitalizing, resetting your body, mind, and spirit. I'm your host and the visionary behind Omni Mindfulness. So what if just one story had the power to shift the trajectory of your life? What if you could become an instrument in helping others realize their true selves? And what if your soul's higher purpose lies in experiencing the joy of Omni Mindfulness? Remember, it's never too late to rewrite your story. Welcome to Season 8 of the Omni Mindfulness Podcast. During this exciting season, we delve deep into the power of mindset. In October, join us as we explore Happy Mind. Is happiness an inside-out job? We'll explore the concept of happiness from various perspectives, ranging from DNA and brain health to mindfulness practices. Moving into November, it's all about conscious connections. Loneliness can be an epidemic, especially during the holidays. Let's understand the art of forming meaningful connections and in december we wrap up 2023 with the theme embodied awareness discover how to connect your body mind and spirit for a holistic approach to life stay tuned for thought-provoking conversations expert insights and transformative stories it's a season you won't want to miss up next, conscious connections in the face of climate change. In today's episode, we're delving into the intersection of conscious connections and climate change with two incredible guests. Laura Hartley, activist and founder of Public Love Enterprises, leads us through the nuanced space between inner and outer change. Her work empowers changemakers to dismantle oppressive systems from within, fostering conditions for social healing and collective thriving. Joining her is council member Priya Butt Patel, a devoted public health professional from the city of Carlsbad in California with over 27 years of residence in Carlsbad. Priya's commitment to public service shines through as she discusses grassroots initiatives, drawing on her experience in improving health access and leading statewide efforts for family justice centers. Get ready for an insightful conversation on conscious connections, grassroots action, and navigating the challenge of climate climate change with these two inspiring voices. Welcome, ladies. I'm so excited for both of you to be here today. Dr. Priya Bhatt Patel and Laura Hartley. Perhaps both of you can take a moment, pause if you need to, take a deep breath, and share with me your thoughts on what does conscious connection mean as it relates to climate change or the environment. 
perhaps um, whoever's ready first. Dr. Priya? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to go first. And thanks for having us, Shilpa. So glad to be here. As, as a public health professional, I know something that I've learned in the past is, you know, how interconnected we are um, as humans, the environment and animals, right? Like it's that triangle when you think of things. And I think for me, once I learned that, I think I became a lot more conscious about my environment and how my actions obviously affect the others in that triangle, the animals, the environment in the triangle. And I think for me, it's about how do I make you know, conscious decisions in my daily life to actually make sure that as we think about sustainability and the environment, how do we actually make that impact happen um, and real impact, right? I think each individual can obviously shift the ways that they behave or act in their daily lives, but we have to do it as a collective. And so I think for me, it's been around how do I not only shift my own behavior, but also inspire those within my own, um, you know, circles. And I think it's a matter of just being able to remind folks that, you know, every day, the things that we do, whether it's throwing away the trash or composting, or, um, you know, actually taking your own bags to the grocery store and really making a decision or produce bags, for instance, just making that small shift can do so much to reduce the impact that we have as humans generated on this planet. And so I think it's really just being mindful of all of the different things that are that make up part of your day, and um, how that might be contributing to, you know, climate change in general. And so I think that's, I would say that would be what I would um, factor in for my conscious connection. Mm, that's I love that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And Laura, perhaps you can um, share your thoughts on this topic. Thank you. And thank you for having us on as well. You know, this is such an important conversation for us to be having. And I really like this question of what does it mean to have a conscious connection in this time? Because, you know, I actually think it, it for me, it really means having an awareness practice around what it means to be alive in a time of a rapidly destabilizing and changing world. You know, we are living in a sense through the sixth mass extinction. What does that mean for us to actually sit with the feelings that that comes up with, with the grief of a changing world, with the loss of habitat around us? And then what is called to us in this time to be part of its remaking, to be part of what could actually be the creation of a more beautiful, a more just and a more regenerative world? So I think that conscious connection in my place first comes back to these feelings within of loss, grief, and then what comes out of that. Well, that's just so beautifully put. And um, that starting with a feeling is something we all can relate to. So that's just so Im intense for me. Um, so I have a round table set of questions. I thought they were appropriate based on our perspective on where each of us plays a role. And Laura, I wanted to start with your role as um, and if I understand correctly, Brim, you can give the audience a little bit of, you know, background, but environmental activism, what does that mean? And in terms of that, where do you see our current state globally in in terms of the environmental movement? Oh, gosh. Okay. So yes, I have uh, been engaged in different forms of environmental and climate activism for a number of years. You know, this has started initially with looking at like well-being economics and what would it mean to kind of start measuring what matters in our culture, uh, all the way through to kind of nonviolent direct action protests and civil disobedience, and then through to the work that I do today, which is all grounded in the realities and urgencies of climate change, which is helping change makers to figure out what is theirs to do in this time, to help navigate the challenges that we can face. And, you know, we live in an incredibly troubling time with climate change. I, I don't believe in really putting a positive spin on it in the sense of the realities and the facts of what we're facing. But I am excited by the potential that could come out of this time. You know, I think whenever we we look at the horrible things about climate change, whether it be the biodiversity loss that we're facing, whether it be increasing natural disasters, whether it be the effects in our food supply, you know, we can also look at, well, actually, what good could come out of this? What possibility could be transformed? Can we have stronger communities? Can we uh, form a, a deeper bond with the natural world? Can we have clean air and clean water? So what would it mean to kind of take the tragicness of right now and actually look at, well, what if, what if it were better? 
And that for me is such a powerful question and that underpins why I do what I do and why I'm so engaged with this movement and why I think we should all do what we can to create a better world. Well, I just love your response to that. What if it truly um, is striking something inside of me emotionally that allows me to feel like even this podcast, maybe this is an, an opportunity to help others become more engaged. Um, Dr. Priya, do you have any thoughts on that before we move on to the next question? I'm ready for the next one for sure. Yeah, thank you. Okay, wonderful. So I was thinking more now in terms of the U.S. and California focus. And we hear a lot about grassroots movement and making a big impact, which I absolutely believe in. But could you share an inspiring example of a local community or, or organization in the U.S. or California or Carlsbad that has tackled what we all perceive as an environmental issue? And um, what was your experience, learning experience from this? Yeah, I mean, I, talking about, I think, you know, just Laura mentioned community and just thinking about Carlsbad and the community that we have here. I mean, we have a community that really likes to come together. And I have to say that one of the most inspirational groups that I've ever come across and is uh, Carlsbad Cleanup Crew, which is actually um, an org organization that the high school stu students started. And I think that just seeing you know, these young folks that are going out there every weekend just to volunteer and clean up around our community is inspiring. And I know that they partner with the Carlsbad Village Association, the Chamber of Commerce, the Richness of Giving, quite a few other local organizations to do larger cleanups. And I believe they just had one this past weekend. And usually they're actually collecting hundreds of pounds of trash, you know, just from one small area in Carlsbad. And I think that if we were doing that all across just our, even our city, we would see how much we collect on a, you know, even on a daily basis. And I, I think that that for me, just seeing that we have such impact from a small group of students that started this off and then grew and grew into a movement of other people joining them here and there, I, I can see what a positive impact it's had on our community. And I think just for other individuals that might have joined them being more mindful of and walking around and seeing, okay, well, that's not supposed to be there. Let me go throw it away. Or that's not supposed to be there. Let me go recycle it. And I think, I think people are starting to see more of the areas that they can actually maybe step up and be a part of that change as well. I find that um, I would say movement so effective because my husband, he loves to go to beach walks at Carlsbad Beach almost daily. And there was this one time he went down one of the cliffs and he just wanted a vantage point to sit and take in the environment. And he noticed a lot of litter. So he, he collected as much as he could carry in his hand. And this woman came running out of her balcony going, what are you doing? And she saw the trash in his hand. And she's like, oh, you sweet man. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. But sometimes it takes each of us to just even be aware and conscious of that. So I, I truly appreciate that movement here in Carlsbad. I, I am hoping that it spreads further out beyond just California. Um, so the third question I have goes back to more global perspective, Laura. And a lot of these issues, we pr probably all are in agreement, are these environmental issues transcend borders. It's not like your air is different than my air, which I think some people may believe. But th from the perspective of knowing these issues are global, um, what are some key global challenges that require immediate attention and collective action? Oh, gosh. So I, I love this question, right? And, it, and it's also such a big question. Like there's so many spaces to answer this. You know, I think you, I would say first when I, you know, this is Rook, this climate crisis, the climate crisis does actually require global attention, right? But that doesn't negate each of us of our individual responsibilities. But, you know, when we are looking at, well, what actually needs to change, I could list things like we need to end our investment in and then rapidly descale our use of oil, coal, gas, 
okay? These are not sustainable. We could be changing our agricultural system, you know, which meat and dairy production counts for about 18% of greenhouse gases. And so we could be looking at, you know, well, what does it mean to have regenerative farming, to also embrace urban agriculture so that food isn't traveling as far and we have more local communities. But ultimately, I think when we're looking at the challenge of implementing any of these, we come up to the issue of capitalism, the economic system that most of us live in. And, you know, capitalism is built on this idea of infinite growth. It's all like the idea of the economy isn't growing, that it's collapsing and that, you know, we're all, it's this kind of terrible thing. It's also built on scarcity, you know, it requires scarcity to drive infinite growth. It really can't exist without that. And these kind of principles are really what are underpinning the climate crisis. Because if we live in a culture that needs constant growth year on year on year without end for it to always be exponential, when we are baking scarcity into a system, then that makes sense that it's leading to the climate crisis. Now, what can be done about capitalism? This is a fascinating question for me, and this is something I think each of us can actually get more engaged with. There are wonderful economic uh, structures, economic ideas that are coming out of all different parts of the world. These include degrowth, donut economics, uh, gross national happiness in Bhutan, well-being economics. And the principle behind these is basically that we can scale down areas of consumption and energy use that are terrible for our environment, while also investing in the things that make us feel good, investing in education, investing in healthcare, investing in, you know, good public infrastructure that we all benefit from. And so degrowth is kind of the opposite of a recession in the sense that things are coming down where maybe have less of an emphasis on GDP, but we are ultimately factoring in what feels good for each of us. Now, this might sound like it's up to the politicians or the activists or the economists, but I truly believe each of us can actually learn more about this. Each of us can get involved with our local communities, our local councils, uh, with local businesses, and start to reimagine well, what would it mean to kind of shape the way that we live and the way that we spend and the way that we use our dollars. And that would have a big interest or a big influence in kind of reshaping the world. So it sounds like we as a collective on a micro level can make an impact. Absolutely. You know, I, I really loved your question before about community, because I do think community is where it comes back to. There's a quote by Rob Hopkins um, that I love where he says, if we, if we wait for government, it will be too little too late. If we work as individuals, it won't be enough. But maybe if we work as communities, it will be just enough, just in time. And so this idea of coming back to who are the people that I spend my money with, who are the people that live nearby me, who are the people who are engaged in my faith group, in my community group, in my workplace, you know, how are we being together? Have we had these conversations? What is it that really matters to us? What do we need to have a better living standard in our particular community? And how can we start to invest in each other and support each other? That's a really powerful place to be. And um, Dr. Priya, I know that you've been involved in our community and perhaps you have a lens and how much effort we've already made and what can we do moving forward? Because it does sound like each of us on a micro level can make a shift, as you had said in the very beginning. Yeah, I mean, I think as a city, we've been trying to make more strides towards whatever we can to address, you know, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, whatever else we can do. I mean, one of the things, and you're right, Laura mentioned, government can be really slow. The first ever motion that I made when I first got elected um, was to divest from fossil fuels, right? That was one of them. Then our next, my next, one of my next motions was, let's think about how we can reduce the usage of single, single use plastics. And it took us almost three years, we finally talked about it. I think it was last summer that we were going to start implementing it this year, right? And so finally, slowly but surely, we've made our way um, from a government entity to have that impact on a more of a, yes, it's micro, but still macro level in the city sense, you know, that it's actually going to work with um, businesses, you know, obviously, uh, whether it's restaurants or others. But I think what we're trying to do, whether it's thinking about electric fleet for our, for our cars, you know, um, and how we can actually transition to that, obviously from, from gas powered cars to hybrid to then electric. Uh, it is incremental, obviously, but 
We've also put in, you know, ordinances that ensure that we're doing photovoltaic systems and actually making sure that as we're moving forward, we're considering other options for cleaner energy. Um, we have clean energy. So I think that we're doing a lot. Um, you know, yes, it's small bite sizes here and there, but I do think that we're really trying to be as mindful as we can be around how do we actually take action on these things? We were, I know, um, one of the first cities in the region to actually have a climate action plan and start thinking about ways that we can move forward on that. So I do think that we take it seriously. I think it's just a matter of, yes, it is a little bit archaic how we have to get things done. Um, but at the same time, you know, there is a process and, uh, and progress can be slow. But I do think that if we can work with community members to really educate and figure out ways that community members can take action on their own, then like Laura was saying, you you can have so much impact, right? I think it's it, it shouldn't just be up to government to make that happen because whatever we can do as a community, and me as a fellow community member and resident, I think that we can do a lot more than just what a government could do or just what one individual could do. Yeah, and I really want to add to that as well, like, because I, I, I actually really love the point that you're coming from, because I think local government and local council and, and state government as well are some of the best places that we can influence and make change. So like often when I'm referring to government, I do mean this kind of wider nationwide federal approach that we're looking at, which can be very difficult to move. But each of us does have influence within our local government, within our local area. And so having this kind of a, a ability to, to create or to communicate what it is that we want for, it, for us together is a really powerful thing. And I really appreciate what you're doing there. Yes, I, I absolutely appreciate it. You were saying? No, I was just thanking Laura. Yeah, no, thank you. And I think that definitely, I, I think local government is where you can make the most impact, regardless of whether I am on council or not. I, I truly believe that local government is where so much of the impact happens. And it, it, though it can also be slow moving, I do think you can actually see changes happening versus, you know, definitely at a larger level, it takes a lot longer to actually see those implemented. And do we have, um, this This might be a naive question, but do we have access to data on how such micro efforts are occurring on other cities? And are they um, emulating the same models uh, based on success? Oh, gosh. I don't know if I know the answer to that question personally, but Laura, I don't know if you're aware if there's something out there, the tool, a tool that's monitoring that at all. No, I'm not aware of any particular data or monitoring on that. And yet I will speak more from a kind of experience level. Um, you know, this kind of, is that absolutely where do you have the most influence, right? Where do your local councils, councillors hang out? They're in the same neighborhood. They know what's going on. You know, there has to be a two-way relationship there. And so there's always this ability to create more change at a hyper-localized level when you have a sense of community, you have a sense of connection, you have a sense of shared common interest and very often shared common values that you can work with. And so from a personal level, I think it's powerful, but I'm not aware of any data. That's 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 fine. I just, the geek in me came out and thinking, oh, <laughs> We can maybe all kind of share knowledge around this. Now, Laura, when I'd spoken to you in the previous podcast, you had talked about some issues being on more of a systemic level, or and I mean, perhaps that concept is not even fully clear in my mind. Perhaps you can sh share what that means, and is it relevant to this conversation and knowing what that impact is? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, climate change is a system problem. It's not coming from one particular thing. It's not this clear linear path that we can trace back and say, you know, a little bit like with the Montreal Convention, where it was around the hole in the ozone layer, where you kind of clearly trace it back to like a particular source that could be banned, great, problem kind of solved. Climate change isn't like that. There are so many factors leading into climate change. And this is why we meet what we mean by system problem. And a lot of the time, the narrative that we have been fed to date around climate change has focused on individual solutions, you know, that you just need to reduce your individual carbon footprint. You just need to, you know, I don't know, catch the public transport a bit more and cycle more and recycle and stop using plastic. And like all of a sudden, everything will be fine. And the reality is that that's nowhere near enough. It's not. We need rapid uh, descaling of our use of fossil fuels. We need to change our entire agricultural system. 
You know, we even need to look at our use of technology, which is incredibly water dependent and water is becoming an increasingly scarce resource in the years to come. But because the problem is so big, and just because the solutions don't lie just with individuals, that doesn't mean that there's nothing that we can do. It means that one, we do need to honor those individual contributions that we can make, right? Where we can use uh, less coffee cups and less plastic bags, we absolutely should. Where we can cycle more, we definitely should. These things are great for us, not just like from an external level, but on an internal level, we feel good doing them. But we also need to kind of learn to work collectively. And this is where the element of community comes in that we were talking about. We need to know how to organize. We need to be able to look at, well, where's the energy coming from in our community? Uh, where's our money going? You know, do we need more cycle lanes? Do we feel safe to cycle here? Uh, is there enough, are there enough jobs in our community? Uh, where is our food coming from? Is it being shipped from thousands of kilometers away or is there the capacity to grow here? What about rewilding? Can we start to rewild some of these areas in our streets with native plants? So there's so many things that we can be doing collectively that aren't just individual decisions, but also are not just the role of government. And in this organizing capacity, we also need to be pushing government at every level to do better, to, to change, uh, to, to take that money out of fossil fuels, to take the money out of carbon and to invest in renewables and to invest in a more just and a more regenerative world. So that's the essence of it. It's big, it's complicated, it needs more than our individual actions, but there is still stuff that we can do. We are not powerless. Um, and Dr. Priya, do you have any thoughts on that as well? Yeah, I mean, I think um, just hearing Laura speak, uh, of course, as the expert on this, it's just really, I think for me as someone who's a policymaker, it's helpful to hear from folks because I think, you know, like like Laura said, we need to be able to hear that these are the things that need to be done. I mean, of course, Carlsbad has done some of those things, but there are other people across the country and across the world that could do, you know, the similar type of advocacy that Laura is talking about, where if there's a way that folks can organize, get involved, and mention that there are really big changes that need to happen in order for us to address this. I think that's how it can work. And so I always um, you know, tell people whatever you can do to be civically engaged, it's so important because it will, I mean, it makes a difference whether it's with regards to climate change or any other issue, but this is something that I think the only way that we'll actually be able to holistically address it is if other individuals in the community get involved and advocate for what they believe needs to happen. And I love that. And I want to advocate really kind of highlight something you said there that you don't need a background in science or environmentalism or activism to be able to do this. I did not have this background myself. I never studied science or climate science. Like that's not my thing. But you know, I was really interested in the world and around what it would mean to have a more beautiful world. And this is the defining crisis of our lifetimes. So anybody can get involved, anybody can advocate for this. And yes, form that connection with your local government. It is one of the most powerful places that we can work. And one of the things that occurred to me, and I, I highlighted when I spoke to you, Dr. Priya, um, in your podcast a few months ago, is how we can make our local schools more involved. And as you mentioned, uh, high school, the high school, I believe, was involved in some of the movements we've had. But starting children at a young age, my son is 10 now, and having him have the awareness, what can he do? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important to, I mean, of course, you know, obviously us having our own behaviors at home are, are so important, right? I think children are sponges and they pick up whatever we're doing, but at the same time, also maybe depending on which school they go to, trying to see what's going on at school, you know, is there something that you can then advocate to the school board about changing? I mean, I have a kid in um, at a preschool, so I'm also trying to be aware of, okay, well, what is the preschool doing? And is there something that, I mean, we're paying money for that, right? So obviously we should have a say in terms of at least something in terms of advocacy as to what they can do to also be part of that change and uh, shift behavior because obviously kids are going to learn from the environments that they are in and so I think it's so important for us to do what we can to obviously as individuals model that behavior but also when they're at school figure out ways that we can implement change in the schools as well if, they, if it hasn't done, been done already so and I love the fact that Laura you mentioned that you don't necessarily need to be an expert because there's a huge part of my own personality where I always feel like I don't want to say anything more unless I can come in with my data or credibility or education. But we all feel, at least I feel, that most of us 
have this vested desire to have an environment that's healthy and having the sentient beings being in a healthy place and also a better future for our children. Yeah, absolutely. We all do. That's the thing. And I think one of the things that I'm most excited about with climate solutions, you know, is that it's not some grim, horrible future that has to be ahead of us. These things are actually great. They're things most of us would want, like cleaner air, like better public transport, uh, you know, more bike lanes, you know, uh, healthier, fresher food. There's just so many good things that come out of climate solutions. And so you don't need a background in science. You don't need to understand all the details of the crisis. You know, I'm not the, I'm not going to sit down and read the, you know, lovely 200 page report that comes out every year on, you know, measuring the data in Antarctica and how much is melting. But you can know that there are problems going on and then ask the question of what do I, what could I do? What am I passionate about? What do I care about? What would bring me joy at the same time? Like none of this work should be hard struggle. Like you're going to feel terrible all the time. It's really about bringing more life, more joy, more creativity, and more community to all of the spaces that we live. And all of that, I want to say, there is a lot invested in the power structures that be and in keeping the power structures that be from taking climate action, because those power structures that be are very much ruled by fossil fuel companies and very much ruled by um, by things that are not necessarily helping the current world. Okay. The best antidote to that is community and connection. It's not powerlessness. It's not apathy. It's joy. It's creativity. It's art. And it's using the skills that we have and the knowledge that we have to go out there and to make a better world. Uh, so profound when you mentioned the word art. I did this on purpose. I am wearing, I don't know if you could see it, um, jewelry that has been designed by a woman that w goes into the rainforest and finds natural elements that would just get washed away and different nuts and seeds. And she creates these lovely art um, decorations or designs and jewelry, it's all sustainable. So a shout out to Alexandra, but her jewelry is a testimony that you can turn these efforts into works of art. You know, I think art is some of the most powerful activism that there is. You know, I really do. I think it helps us to see things differently. It connects us with beauty. You know, beauty is always this portal to transformation. So like art is very powerful if we can think about all the ways that we can start to use it and embrace it in our lives. Absolutely. And there are so many little things that I do. I've mentioned to Laura in the past is just I, I'm very passionate about making sure that anything that's plastic gets washed and put, some, put in the recycle and little elements of whatever I can do to sustain our our environment on a micro level, I suppose. Absolutely. You know, and I think if people are looking for like, as individuals, like what are three big things that I could actually do? Like, you know, divest, divest your money. Um, I know Priya was talking about that before, about how like your council was divesting funds from fossil fuels. We can do that individually. We can do that from our banks, our pension funds, divest your money into ethical banks. You know, there's a term called guerrilla gardening, like where you can like go out and like plant seeds and throw seeds of like native plants in kind of public areas. I don't know how you feel about that, Priya, I'm sorry, but it's like very <laughs> powerful, um, you know, to kind of get out there and like, hey, let's let's get more greenery, get more stuff that really should be here on the sidewalks, on that little green strip somewhere, you know, and, you know, eat less meat and dairy. Doesn't need to be everything, doesn't need to be completely vegan, but eat less, you know, look at regenerative farming. Look at these, um, where we're getting our, our meat and our dairy from. And so this combined with things like plastics and really recognizing what we're doing with those with those materials in our lives is so important and things each and every one of us can do. Yes, um, and I, I'm glad you said that because that's how I wanted to wrap up our conversation is what are things that are actionable that we can do now and perhaps all of us can come back in a few weeks or months or later saying, this is the one action I took and I followed through. Um, um, Priya, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, you know, start to get to know who your local electeds are. I think that's really important, especially if we're talking about bringing community together, maybe figure out what is that one thing that I feel like I can actually change and I'd be excited about going back to Laura's point 
you have to be excited about wanting to make that change happen because just having that intrinsic motivation around wanting to make that change will make it so much more enjoyable. But at the same time, once you've actually achieved the outcome, it'll be something that, you know, the entire community, I feel like can get behind. So getting to know your local elected officials is really important and maybe even setting up time to chat with them and say, hey, what are we doing to actually, you know, impact some sort of climate change efforts here specifically within our community? Uh, I think the other thing is just taking a look around your own environment in your house, uh, where you go, where you, I think, again, kind of similar to what we were chatting about earlier, where are you spending your money? What what types of things are you doing on a day to day where you might be able to shift some of that behavior? I know, for instance, we I kind of reassessed how we do laundry, for instance, that's just a very simple one. But now I use wool dryer balls, you know, and I'm trying to actually utilize um, detergent that's actually more beneficial for the environment. It's actually natural. And so I'm trying to shift more things within our own house to make sure that I'm doing everything I can. I mean, of course, it's one person, but hopefully I can then inspire others within my own circles to do the same. And again, that collective effort is something that really makes a difference. So I would say those would be at least a couple of things that I would talk about. And then anything, you know, we can do to make sure that our next generation is also thinking about these as we move forward is really important. And I know for my son, I mean, I take him on cleanups. I try to explain to him why we have wool dryer balls, for instance, you know, so I'm trying to explain what what it means. I mean, he's two, but hopefully it allows for him to be able to really understand and be critically aware of all of the things in his environment and make better decisions as he grows up and and is a full blown adult and making some of those decisions, too. So what I was saying was that where I purchase a lot of my uh, cleaning products is through an online environmentally conscious company. I've been doing that for a couple of years. And so the way they pack their items and the way they take that money that I give them, they donate some of that towards the environment. Those are there are so many ways to do that, meaning like even like my annual Christmas cards have been coming from a company that plant a tree and everything is recycled. That's beautiful. And that, that's the thing, like there are great companies out there doing this that are very often small businesses as well that, you know, we love to support. So wherever you can find these like wonderful alternatives that are there, like we absolutely should be. Well, thank you, both of you. I um, will be reaching out to local representatives. Maybe I could even have them on the podcast. I have some wild ideas of what I'd like to do. And I know that some of those efforts are feasible if I can have the right knowledge. And I think a lot of us, maybe we just don't have the right knowledge to do what we think might be kind of too too wild for our, our local environment. And here's the thing, in this time, there is no thinking small. There is no benefit in thinking small in this time. The bigger that we can dream, the deeper questions that we can ask, the more we can assess what really matters to us and what makes us happy, the better this planet will be. And so this is urgent and necessary and beautiful opportunities that we have through this time. Absolutely. Any any parting thoughts from either of you? And I hope both of you would love to come back for a follow-up. Of course. <laughs> Absolutely, anytime. Thank you so much. So I hope both of you have a wonderful day. We will continue making effort on every level we can. And I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in, sweet soul. If you've enjoyed this episode, I would be so grateful for your kind review on Apple Podcast. Simply click on the link in the show notes to leave your lovely feedback and uplift our spirits. Your support means the world to me and helps our show thrive. So please show me your love and continue to practice Omni Mindfulness.